Okay, thanks, Jake. We're going to now move on to the presentation. Uh, first off is Dr. Mike Schmoker. Mike? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I, I would like to, to, to start out by simply saying that what I'll be sharing with you in the next few minutes is intended to simplify school improvement, to, to help us to see that uh, enormous strides could be made by virtually any school, any teacher. And uh, the, the key, I think, is for us to focus on those things that matter most. You'll notice the, the use of the term brutal facts. There will be a few of those in this presentation. And uh, it's important, I think, for us to look at some brutal facts about about schooling uh, in order for us to, to get past them. Now, I always like to start with this question uh, with audiences. Easier to do when I can see you all, but I'll, I'll typically ask an audience, all right, do we truly want better schools? And of course, the obvious answer is sure, of course we want better schools. And I like to say, well, con consider this fact. If, if I ask focus groups, like I've done hundreds of times, what do you think about worksheets? Do you think they're a good thing to use in schools? Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, my audiences will indicate by, by show of hands that they know for sure that worksheets are one of the worst things you could give a kid in a, in a typical school day, and more than 90% of my audiences. And I say, well, just for fun, turn to the person next to you and consider what percentage of the school year actually gets used um, uh, consumed using worksheets. I can, I, I never wind up with anything less than 25%. Now that's, that is the same as uh, one whole grading period. One whole grading period goes out the window every year. And I'm not even counting things like movies and other forms of uh, excessive use of movies that constitute a kind of um, fluff that uh, interferes with students learning good things in school. And so, again, I just want you, as, as you may know, um, I, I want us to consider the fact that the things that make the biggest difference in our schools are those, are those brutal facts. The knowledge of those things that we currently do that, that we know we should not do. Worksheets are uh, one of the largest uh, considerations here. Now, once we, once we start to consider, well, gosh, what if we, got, what if we recovered that? 25 or 30. And, and Mike, sorry to interrupt. We do have a couple people um, saying it's a little bit hard to hear you. If you could just speak up a little bit. That'd okay, be we'll do. Is this Maybe this is a little bit better. Okay. Um, what if we recovered that 25% or more of the school year? Uh, and then I always, always like people to just ponder for a moment. What would happen? Well, it would have more impact on student achievement and learning than all of the staff development, um, all of the school reforms we've done in the history of education. Overnight, there'd be that kind of uh, incredible dramatic difference. Right now, the system such as it is gives us about 7% of low-income students. You might wonder, some, of, some people may not know this, about 26, 27% of the, of the um, adult population has a bachelor's degree. Low income, more like 7%, and it's closely linked to this next statistic. About a third of the kids who actually get to college are ready for it. That's because K-12 doesn't do certain things, doesn't do them enough, doesn't do them well, doesn't pay near enough attention to them, and this is why you're so terribly lucky to have me talking to you today. Be not because of my original research, but because I'm about to share something with you, which I truly think, if we took it seriously, could, could make a fantastic difference for kids. Look up there, college success. And, and the same thing goes for careers, and if I may interject, they have done studies that show that college preparation, just being ready for college, corresponds to about nine, by about 90% to what is uh, required to, uh, to, to thrive and succeed in careers. Big overlap there. Now, you look there and you think, okay, analytical reading and discussion and persuasive writing. When I say persuasive writing, I would add, I don't mean persuasive writing about stuff off the top of your head. It's argumentative writing based on one or more documents that the student or you and I have closely read. That matters more than anything, and it matters in these four modes. Draw inferences and conclusions from text. Example, have students read second graders. Have second graders read Jack and the Beanstalk and have them teach them, teach them how to 
closely read, underline, annotate to determine what they think of Jack. That's reading for inference. That's drawing your own conclusions about characters. All these overlap. These four overlap a lot. Don't worry about that. Analyze conflicting source documents. Give students two documents. One that says Walmart is a good thing for the U.S. economy. One that says, no, Walmart, in fact, has had a negative effect on the U.S. economy and on many small towns and their uh, economic infrastructure. Students need literally hundreds upon hundreds of opportunities to closely read, discuss, and, t and write about uh, documents in this fashion. Support arguments with evidence. Uh, we've been talking about that already. If you argued for or against Walmart, uh, if you arg argued that Jack is uh, a certain kind of person, um, if, you, if you argue for just about anything based on something you've read. Solve complex problems with no obvious answer. An example might be, uh, should we or should we not add a big, big box Walmart uh, on the outskirts or within the town limits of, of where we live right now? That is the stuff that matters more than anything if you want students to get into school. It should not require enormous imagination to realize we do not do such things very much in school. If we did, if we did, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the nature of public education, our ability to reach all kids such that virtually every kid that attended got a terrific education would, would change, I don't want to say overnight, but within literally a few short years, as, as few as five, according to people like Bob Marzano. Now, you'll notice everything I'm talking about has nothing to do with influences um, or factors outside of the school. Yes, there are such factors, but the stuff that matters most, and we know this from William Sanders' value-added work, we know it from Mar Marzano, Kane, and Hanischek, uh, the, the big difference comes from what the teacher does. And, and this is where I want to stress. What the teacher does doesn't come down to each teacher having a, a, a vast repertoire of, cr of creative um, ideas, lesson plans, units. It comes down to them just consistently doing their honest human best at about three things, reading, writing, and talking as they learn. And uh, just to give us a sense of the impact that could have, Mortimer and Sammons found that teaching has six to ten times as much impact as socioeconomic or other factors. And here's the kicker. Some of you, maybe not all of you, uh, know of a guy named Dylan William, whose name is starting to get around. But everybody knows the term formative assessment. A simple translation of, a, of formative assessment is check for understanding. Check for understanding. When you check for understanding multiple times in the course of a lesson, your kids will learn four times as quickly. Four times as quickly. That's what Dylan William is talking about when he says 400% speed of learning differences. To put this in context, when we look at the teachers who, get, who have the big impact, the ones who have six to ten times as much impact, say, as, as other factors or other, or other teachers, the, the one characteristic they embrace um, uh, more than any that makes the biggest difference is, is uh, check for understanding. It comes, as many of you know, comes right out of that, that old 50-plus-year-old uh, uh, model of teaching advocated in advance by people like Madeline Hunter and now Bob Marzano and Fisher and Fry and other people. Trouble is, there ain't much of that kind of teaching going on in schools. Take a look at these remarks. I could add others, but this is a brief presentation. We don't do these things. If we did, once again, the difference would be enormous and it would be immediate. Just to pound home this notion, I want you to just consider that the, you could argue that the reason we don't have better schools is because we do not inspect the two things that matter most, and it's what we teach and it's how we teach. And you can see all the different people who endorse that. Now, I want to tell you a little story about a guy named Sean Connors to put wheels on the, this idea and to demonstrate it uh, to you. Sean Connors came into the town I lived in, oh, 11, 12 years ago, I was living in Flagstaff, Arizona. He taught at our poorest, most diverse high school uh, by far. They always, 20-some percent fewer kids each year passed exams on anything year after year. One teacher comes in, and he began to teach in this fashion. 
an effective lesson. What he taught and how he taught. He taught a good, sound curriculum. No worksheets, no movies. He made sure, and you, you know this stuff. This is not unfamiliar. He was crystal clear about the standard, whether he's asking kids for, on that particular day to learn how to infer, uh, make uh, inferences about characters, write an effective introductory paragraph. He scaffolded his instruction step by step. Between each one, he did check for understanding. I'll pause to say the reason I'm uh, encouraged by, uh, by the uh, product um, that uh, Turning Technologies, I I'm very encouraged by the product Turning Technologies produces, which, which, is, which are the clickers that allow a teacher, not just once or twice, but multiple times, to see how many students are, in fact, learning each step or chunk in a lesson. Again, I I'm going to say that is one of the that is either the most profound, powerful factor that's going to affect how many of our kids are going to learn, or it's a, it's a close contender for number one or number two. Using models and exemplars, when will we learn? Anytime we ask kids to read, we ought to say, and look, here's a good example of a student or a profession piece of writing. Let's go through that. Look at, what, look at how that uh, good piece of writing works and operates. Here's what we want you to um, mimic from that. Now, you see where I wrote engagement on task behavior. Uh, he never called on kids with their hands raised. Never. He only called on kids randomly, operating basically in the same uh, way that, uh, that clicker technology works. And finally, and this is important, he never actually asked students to, take an to, to complete an assessment or an assignment until he had done this, these steps of guided practice, check for understanding multiple times, could see that they had mastered each step. Now they were ready to write their own introductory paragraphs. Then and only then did he move on. Now, the question is, what sort of difference does that kind of teaching make? Which I'm hoping, I'm hoping you were almost bored as I went through this because you're thinking, well, I think we know that. That model has been around for 50 some years. Many of us do it when we're evaluated. And I would just say, are we really aware that that model, um, in the hands of a guy like Sean Connors, uh, caused his whole school, not just his class, his whole school, to make the biggest gains in the English language arts assessment in the state of Arizona. One teacher, imagine if all or most teachers began to consistently do those things. And again, there's a, there's a short list of endorsements for this basic, hugely effective model of instruction. Now, I'm going to move along pretty quickly here. Why don't we get that kind of instruction? Well, because we don't inspect it, and you can't expect what you don't inspect. We need to start inspecting instruction and curriculum. So I just want to talk about these couple things in the next few couple of moments. Guaranteed and viable curriculum, which is another word for what we teach. Simplify leadership to make the first Roman, two Roman numerals cook. And then radically, radically redefine what we call literacy instruction. Uh, literacy instruction is, 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 is in the, the most woeful mess of, of, of all, of anything in our curriculums. I don't know how many of you have been involved in uh, strategic or improvement planning, but I wonder if some of you feel like I do at times about this. Sorry. Meaning, we should know strategic planning, and I could go on about this. I wrote an article called Tipping Point about it. Strategic planning not only has no impact on instruction or its quality, it prevents us from implementing professional learning communities, which is about the best, most potent structure for improving curriculum and instruction that we know of. Here's just quick examples. I'm with, I, this, this is in a place that I worked. Take a look at that formula up above. That's what a PLC is. When I worked with the following three teams. Uh, here's what happened. I was working with an English department at a low socioeconomic school where I was at the central office. They told me that thesis statements and introductions, almost none of their kids could do those well. And I said, well, let's have a half hour meeting. We had a half hour meeting, uh, created a lesson for it in, team, in a team, came back and we had more than 50% of our students producing beautiful thesis statements and introductions. We refined the lesson, gave it another shot, came back the next time, almost 100% of students writing beautiful thesis statements. Same storyline, different school, different topic. Two meetings, almost 100% of students producing, um, excuse me, um, demonstrating their knowledge about the physics of how a rainbow works. 
Lake Havasu High School, again, where I was a full-time employee, working with four math teachers who said, you know, we can't, you'll never get these teachers, excuse me, these students to learn operations with negative and positive integers. One meeting together, and they went out, implemented their lesson, which they had built as a team. 100% of their students succeeded on their assessment of operations with negative and positive integers. This is the, the power. This is the, these are the kinds of results that await us if we just take that seriously. Now, let's look at this huge factor. Guaranteed and viable curriculum basically means a common curriculum where, common curriculum where we have pared down the number of standards to where we can teach them adequately and in depth. And by in depth, that has to include close reading, discussion, and writing. It's the number one factor. And I just would invite you to look at the question that I have there. Right now, in terms of guaranteed and viable curriculum, Ask yourselves, what's the answer to that question? Every focus group, every audience I've ever talked to agrees. We have a, the answer is a fairly resounding uh, no, no. What do we have to do to correct that? Well, first we've got to come to terms with the fact that we do not teach guaranteed, common, viable curriculum. But to fix that, we need to organize our content by quarter and do one or two more things. We have to give common assessments at the end of each grading period. These are the simple things, and believe this or not, that turn schools around. These are what make it happen. We, or for every course, we organize what we're going to teach each grading period. We give common assessments, and we use those, the results of those common assessments to continuously refine our efforts to get better and better results on those common assessments. And I would just add that we make darn sure that our assessments are rich with uh, an intellectual college prep component. What kind of leadership would allow those two things, what and how, to really um, establish a beachhead in our schools and become uh, routine practices. Well, it better not be complicated. It better not be compl It better not be something that only the rare superman or superwoman can pull off. And I want to say it's really a couple of things. Versions of the following. About once a month, maybe twice a month, someone in the building, and I suggest people do this in pairs, walk through and they look for, I, I recommend highly, just one area that's essential to success. Hit 15 classrooms, see how many of those 15 you see common essential standards. If it's only a few, if it's only five, if it's only eight, that becomes topic one at the next faculty meeting and we work on correcting it. If we, if we get that to where we, we've, we've, got our, we, we've, we've done good work there, we're consistently seeing essential standards taught, we move on to other areas until we're consistently seeing them in our schools. One more thing, and the best schools I know of do these two things more than anything, and they focus unwaveringly on these two things. Once a quarter or so, we sit down with teams, an administrator, a teacher leader, a department head, doesn't matter. You look at quarterly assessments. We discuss where we're strong, where we're weak, how can we, how we can improve. Grade books are invaluable at these meetings. Scored work samples, just as invaluable, especially in English, but also social studies and other courses. Now I always like to ask my audiences, do you think these two things, the walkthroughs and the quarterly sit-downs to review the quarterly assessments, those two things, I, I ask my audiences this all the time, and I say, how many of you agree, yes, this is reasonable and fair, and if we push the question a bit, it would in fact have a, a dramatic impact on the consistency with which what gets taught and how it gets taught is of a high quality. Meetings, believe it or not, have an awful lot to do with making these good things happen. And I just want to throw up, these are my, for, for me, these are the highest priority things to do with meetings. Not Meetings are not for announcements. They're for discussing whether or not all of the schools
schools in your district now have a steering committee? Because without a steering committee, as Doug Reeves and lots of other people, the DeFores and others have told us, you're never going to get an initiative going unless the principal has a team of teachers who help guide the ship uh, over the course of uh, the change process. You're not going to see good things or, or you're not going to see improvements until you've done some kind of some kind of presentation explaining the research behind guaranteed curriculum, the research behind uh, this uh, well-known structure for a good lesson that includes check for understanding, which, which has that as a prominent part. We need people to, we need to literally monitor and collect data on how many teams literally use team meeting norms because Lots of us out there these days say we're, we're PLC schools, but we're not using these norms without the norms. T team meetings tend not to be very effective or productive. And we need to produce. If you'll read that for a moment, please. We need to produce common assessments and common standards maps for every course we teach and celebrate the completion of this with each and every course we do this for. And we need to celebrate other things, discuss and celebrate other things at our team meetings of this nature. I strongly encourage you to come back to this slide, which I assume you have, and take a hard look at that and ask yourselves, how much of that kind of thing are we doing at our meetings right now? And let's see, there we go. It's so important to celebrate those small wins. We should know that by now. Look what can happen. My last piece here is just a few minutes on this. Read that quote, if you will, and ask yourself, do you agree with that? My audiences overwhelmingly agree that literacy skills are, a, are foundational to learning in all areas, but here's the, here's the sad, brutal fact. What Allington calls a reading and writing versus stuff ratio is completely out of whack. That ratio is such that Lucy McCormick Hawkins and, and myself and every observer I know who spent time in classrooms knows that even in English, even in reading period, tiny inexcusably small amounts of actual reading and writing go on in schools, which, I, I, I want to say this with great seriousness, is the principal reason we have an achievement gap. No other reason rivals that. If we let, if we simply would let kids read more in school, that would have more impact than any single thing we could do. Lots of silly stuff interferes with good English writing, literacy, instruction, what uh, Calkins calls literature-based arts and crafts. Look at some of these things. Folks, that stuff has absolutely no business in a school. In art class, absolutely, but, nowhere, but not anywhere else. This is the kind of stuff that is crowding out uh, a, a true education for our students. Look, look at the kind of stuff. I'm not cherry picking here. This kind of stuff goes on in virtually every school I see abundantly. Mike Rose, who rose from poverty to being a professor at UCLA, said, look, here's how, here's how people learn, and here's how people rise up out of poverty. You pack the curriculum, science, social studies, English, and math, with reading and writing and talking. That's how we come to understandings. How important is writing? Very important. There's a couple of slides left here. I just want to give you a taste of what we could be doing. Um, we should be, on a regular basis, putting issues of the day, textbook material, asking provocative, controversial questions, 
do you do you like or do you not like um, Andrew Jackson? Uh, do you think we should have entered World War One? Or as we read the chapter and, our, and and we learn about World War One, what are the lessons from that war? What did we learn or do right or wrong in the run up to that war? Why did we enter? Were those were they good reasons? What happened during the conduct of the war that we approve or disapprove of? What happened in the aftermath? This is the sort of stuff that ought to be the, the, a steady diet in every, in every course wherever possible. Do kids like to talk about things like this? Let me tell you, with, with great confidence, they love talking about stuff like this. And uh, Talking and writing, and they enjoy writing if they had the chance to closely read doc, one or more documents and then talk about them. They are way more interested in and, and can write way better. little fact you might not know, 83% of kids when polled by uh, ASCD said that their favorite way to learn was after they read something to discuss it and especially to debate and argue about it. So there is plenty of opportunity there. This is my last slide. Um, that's the, this, is, folks, this, this kind of sums up, however incompletely, the things that I think we need to focus on much more than we do now. These need to be the central core of a good education in every discipline. And I'm done, and thank you.